Today, I'd like to tell you about some of the work that we've done um, largely since the COVID pandemic with a focus on uh, stem cells as architects of their niches and their mechanical forces. Uh, but I also want to uh, put it in perspective. And uh, I always like to start off with a uh, relatively recent uh, trip that I took, the last trip I was able to take, uh, which was in the Galapagos Islands shortly before uh, COVID uh, hit. And, uh, and I use it as an example just to illustrate the incredible diversity that uh, nature has done with regards to body surfaces in a way that really she hasn't uh, paid nearly this kind of uh, fantastical attention uh, to with any of the other organs that most of you work on. And uh, my laboratory uh, doesn't go very much deeper into what you see here. Uh, we focus on the skin epithelium uh, at the outer surface of, of the skin. And when I was a graduate student, as Evan kind of alluded to, uh, I heard this talk by Howard Green uh, taking a piece of human skin and being able to culture it and isolate cells that he could passage endlessly and they could still make skin tissue. And to me, working on bacteria at the time, I was just wrapped by that, uh, that finding and I went to his laboratory to train. And, uh, and so we've been culturing uh, epidermal stem cells in the laboratory. We weren't even calling them stem cells at the time for many, many years. And this really served as the foundation for what was going to come some five years later, which was utilization of the realization that stem cells are not operating in vacuums. They depend upon their, uh, their neighbors for uh, their sustenance. And that really led to the use that Howard did for fibroblast feeder layer. And it also led to the breakthroughs for embryonic stem cell culture, uh, which at the time had baffled people uh, who were trying to do so. And so back in the early uh, days of my work at the University of Chicago, as an assistant professor, we were already making organoid cultures uh, in the laboratory using human epidermal stem cells as a founding. And so we really uh, have many examples of, uh, of stem cell biology that were really launched by the study of skin. And one was from Howard Green's work uh, using the skin epithelial stem cells to be able to make uh, do treatments for burn therapy, taking a small piece of a patient's bad skin, burn skin, and expanding it, making tissue culture, sorry, of good skin, making tissue culture dishes, uh, and then applying those good cells back onto the burned skin. And so uh, these are early examples. In fact, the first examples of the use of purified populations of stem cells in a clinical setting. And I want to point out that only a few stem cells were necessary for the entire body replacement. Uh, and some of these kids were burned, 95% of their body surface was burned, and yet they were still rescued with regards to their skin epidermis by virtue of uh, culturing uh, sheets of epidermal cells in this fashion and doing the engraftments. And so uh, that just illustrates the extraordinary capacity that stem cells have for regenerative medicine. So back when I was still doing my postdoctoral work, uh, we were identifying the major structural proteins that were expressed by these stem cells. These are keratins. And, uh, and then when I started my laboratory, I began with cloning and characterizing the keratin cDNAs and their genes. And then after that, it was really working with these proteins that we were able for the first time to isolate and characterize and be able to identify mutations that were critical in terms of perturbing the overall keratin cytoskeleton. And uh, then we cycled uh, the mutant genes into mice to come down with the uh, identifying the genetic basis for these various different skin disorders and uh, demonstrating that these are blistering skin disorders. So why am I telling you this after all of those years? I think it's important to consider uh, 
that the uh, that the stem cells are at the body surface and they're subjected to various different stresses. And uh, these stem cells have to be able to protect themselves. And so one of the ways in which they do that is to make an elaborate cytoskeleton. And this really gave us the clues because the mute mutations in the keratin cytoskeleton caused the epidermal stem cells to rupture upon physical stress. And uh, this disorder known as epidermolysis bullosa simplex was the first of the blistering disorders that we and others went on to uh, work out the genetic basis for. And so uh, several things to consider. First of all, that the skin stem cells produce an extensive keratin cytoskeleton interconnected to desmosomes and hemidesmosomes that provide them with this inner mechanical framework to be able to withstand mechanical stress and adhere to the underlying basement membrane. But the stem cells cannot be made like bricks. They still have to divide. And in addition, there are other assaults that the skin surface has to face. And so over the years, we've been studying some of these stresses, uh, consider not only mechanical stress, but also pathogens, wounds, oncogenic stress, ultraviolet stress, uh, and various different microbes, and also consider temperatures and pH extremes. If you go outdoors, well, if you go outdoors in California and you come back indoors again, maybe your temperature is a little bit higher uh, than it normally is uh, with regards to um, most tissues. But for us, if you go outdoors in the wintertime, it comes that you come back in and it is noticeably colder. And so, uh, whereas the liver always stays at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the skin epithelium really undergoes these extraordinary shifts in pH and temperature extremes. pH of your skin surface is 5.5. Very few, uh, including the epidermal stem cells, can survive under those kinds of conditions. And so how are the stem cells then poised to be able to sense these changes and rapidly adjust? I want to start with a a publication that came out in March of 2020 during the COVID pandemic when it was at its height. And this is the work of Felipe Garcia Carroz, who has now gone on to start his laboratory at uh, Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech. And here we'll deal with climate change. So the skin epidermis is an environment of extremes. And as I said, that includes temperature, pH, it also includes humidity. And I also mentioned that the body surface is very acidic. So Felipe was engineering synthetic polymers at Duke in biomedical uh, engineering and synthetic polymers that were optimal in undergoing concentration dependent, thermal dependent and pH dependent transitions in their conformation. And then he scanned the human proteome for proteins that share these features and what he found were differentiation specific epidermal proteins at the top of that list. And that included the differentiation specific keratins that I had shown back when I was a postdoc are induced as epidermal stem cells commit to terminally differentiate and move outward toward the skin surface. They produce a different infrastructure that is much more resistant and incompatible with cell division. But here, uh, these proteins um, at their the the not non uh, the uh, head and tail domains of these proteins had these properties of undergoing these pH sensitive thermal uh, dependent switches in conformation. Another differentiation specific protein that had these kinds of properties was flagrin and flagrin paralogs. And these were proteins we've known about for a long time. They are produced again in the terminally differentiated cells, but in this case, these proteins accumulate in uh, what are known as keratohyaline granules. And people have always visualized these as kind of rocks inside the cells at the latter stages of terminal differentiation without a real understanding of what these things are doing and why they're doing it. And it turns out that proteins that have these kinds of dynamics for go undergoing these types of conformational changes are proteins that, um, uh, that are then the ones that are forming the um, skin barrier. And, uh, and they are dynamic 
These are also proteins that actually are characteristic of proteins that undergo these uh, abilities to um, produce oil-like droplets or liquid-liquid phase transitions inside cells. And that's another hot topic. It's really a topic of protein conformation, and these are the kinds of proteins that are able to do so. So, for instance, if we just tag one of these filaggrin proteins and put it into a epidermal stem cell and culture, what we find is that these are not rocks inside these cells, that these are liquid fluid-like granules, and you can see them fuse with one another, one of the characteristics. We can also apply atomic force microscopy to the stem cells, and we see these granules uh, squish in, uh, in response. We can also use fluorescence recovery after photobleaching to be able to see the dynamics of the materials. If we photobleach an area and then look at how fast it recovers, it recovers within a matter of seconds. Very dynamic oil-like droplets inside the cell. So what are they really doing? Um, and to gain some insights into this, we made transgenic mice that express a fluorescent histone, H2B-RFP, and here we're using a, uh, a GFP-tagged innocuous sensor, a sensor that'll recognize filaggrin, but only in its phase-separated state. And that's important because you don't want to add a tag to a protein, which can alter its uh, conformational change. And, uh, and as uh, Roger Chen showed at UCSD, showed many years ago, you can really uh, make uh, GFP type proteins with all sorts of different amino acid compositions, dramatically changing the properties of these kinds of proteins. And so here we engineered a, uh, an innocuous sensor that had basically the right type of amino acid composition that, uh, but in a scrambled form, that would basically very weakly recognize filaggrin and only in this conformational change state. And so how do we actually make, do rapid genetics? We now uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, the living embryo right after gastrulation has just a single layer of skin cells, skin progenitor cells at, at the body surface. And if we simply inject the amniotic sac with lentivirus, we can rapidly transduce the skin epithelium uh, and thereafter it's propagated stably with anything we package into the lentivirus. And so it, we showed a number of years ago, if you package H2B RFP, within a matter of days, now the skin has stratified, the hair follicles have formed and they're all transduced stably but the uh, underlying dermis is not transduced and that contains all sorts of different cell types. And so now we simply add the flagrant sensor and then um, make these mice. And now I'm going to show you what happens when we look at skin through the lens of phase separation. And to give you a perspective, the epidermis is a stratified epithelium. The outermost layer is the skin surface. Uh, that is at this pH 5.5. The stem cells are tucked down here. They're in the innermost basal layer. And as these cells commit to terminally differentiate and the cells move outward, uh, they go through these various different phases, transcriptionally active until the very end. And uh, it's only when uh, the cells reach this granular layer that you start to see these filaggrin rich granules start to accumulate. So uh, using live imaging then, we're going to be looking at the process. And what we learned from this actually, from transcription, you see that filaggrin synthesis starts as soon as the stem cells commit to differentiate, but it must reach a critical conformation in order to undergo these liquid-liquid phase transitions. They are concentration dependent. So now we'll take a look at a movie I'm going to show you a movie showing you a planar view, a slice, a movie from a slice of the skin epithelium, if you will. Um, uh, and um, now you can see that the granules form and they grow, they grow bigger. They really pack the entire cytoplasm with, uh, with these granules. And then all of a sudden you see the granules disappear. So that's the same cell. And if you watch it long enough, all of a sudden the granules disappear. And that is this transition that we've never understood 
from the granular layer to the skin surface. And that transition is absolutely essential for maintaining the barrier. So let's take a look at what's happening in the chromatin now. This is the same time frame. We're dealing with minutes in terms of the movie. And now you watch, the granules have grown. When the granules dissolve, what you see is chromatin compacts and then the chromatin, the nucleus, disappears. And so these two processes are happening with a matter, within a matter of minutes of each other. They must be linked. So what's happening here? So the process is dynamic. Granular formation is driven by critical concentration. The protein has to accumulate to a certain level before the switch occurs. But then, what's causing the granular dissolution and nuclear loss? And so, here we've begun to look at this question. And first of all, we looked at it from taking into consideration that filagrin is rich in histidine. That is a pKa of 6.3. As the epidermal stem cells are committing to differentiate, they're leaving an environment where they're 7.4 pH, and they're going up to an environment of pH 5.5. And it turns out that as soon as the cells experience pH 6.3, that's when we see the granules dissolve. So what is causing, then, this um, phenomenon of nuclear loss? Well. Our thinking is that it could be that as these granules form, they could be sequestering all sorts of destructive enzymes that are released at that last stage where the granular cells then move into the stratum corneum lay layer and lose all their organelles in their nucleus and flatten out. But we also notice that there's mechanical deformation that is occurring uh, as the keratohyaline granules, as filagrin uh, concentration continues to rise, the granules get larger and larger. They also get more viscous, as we demonstrated in, uh, the in the science paper that we published. And in addition, those keratin filaments have these protruding ends that also have these non-structured uh, uh, repeats. And they, too, then undergo these conformational changes. So the whole network at the end is basically this dense keratin network that is integrating these keratohyaline granules that are becoming increasingly viscous. And what that does is it turns out it puts mechanical pressure on the nuclei, and we think that that mechanical pressure then is also contributing to the sudden loss of the granules and the organelles in the cells. So why, is, why am I telling you this and why is it relevant besides the fact that we published this during the COVID pandemic? It's relevant because there is a very common skin disorder known as atopic dermatitis that ha is associated with patients that have skin barrier defects. They also lack keratohyaline granules. They also retain their nuclei, and they also uh, um, have mutations in filagrin. And when you look at those mutations, those mutations are scattered along the filagrin protein. We've known about them for a long time, but nobody has really uh, understood what they mean. What they mean is that they're creating these truncated proteins. And when we looked at engineering those truncated proteins and started to look at them through the lens of phase separation, we discovered that, in fact, when you truncate the protein too much and have fewer and fewer repeats, you can never accumulate a nanomolar or picomolar or feptomolar concentration that is high enough within, within the cell in order for these liquid phase transitions to occur. So they don't occur, and you never see the granules forming. So it also turns out then that when you don't form those granules, you also uh, accumulate the nuclei and the organelles. And so the outcome is nuclear retention, and it's also skin barrier defects. And so that's in the paper. I think it's an interesting paper. It covers a disease that is very common throughout the uh, human population. So in producing the skin barrier, the stem cells are tucked nicely beneath the layers of enucleated dead cells that have to face the harsh environment at the body surface. They're the ones that have to face the pH 5.5. It's not the stem cells. The stem cells are tucked nicely in that innermost basal layer. 
and they're at pH 7.4. And in addition, getting back to that cytoskeleton that we worked on for so many years in the, uh, in the beginning of my career, it turns out that that cytoskeleton then can remain dynamic and compatible with cell division because it doesn't have to do all of the strength with regards to protecting the stem cells. So the stem cells also interestingly produce an underlying basement membrane. For years it's been not clear do they do, who produces the basement membrane rich in extracellular matrix and growth factors, but it's largely the lion's share role of the stem cells that are doing that. And they also control the rate of basement membrane assembly. So when you think about it, the stem cells are really architects of their own niche, what's above it and what's below it. So now I'm gonna move into several months later into the COVID pandemic, where we recently published uh, a paper that deals with the focus of this talk today. And that, is, uh, and that is the realization that stem cells also create the mechanical forces that are impacting their behavior. This is the work of Vince Fiore, who's another biomedical engineer, biomechanical engineer in my laboratory. So here, what we did is we just started out by looking at normal skin epidermis, and Vince uh, used atomic force microscopy to measure the stiffness of the stem cells, of the basement membrane, of the, of the differentiated cells. And when you look at this, and of the dermis, and when you look at the stiffness, what you find is that it's those outer layers that I've been talking about that have the stiffest characteristics of the tissue. And it goes downward. There's a real gradient in mechanical stiffness down to the dermis, which is actually less, less stiff than even the basal epidermal layer. So mechanical forces from terminally differentiating layers of the epidermis then are creating a gradient of increasing stiffness from the dermis to the outer surface of the skin. So that then isn't the whole story. Here we started to do ex vivo measurements on the basement membrane, which the epidermal stem cells are also producing. And here what we found is by taking, uh, doing a measure where we can take out the epidermis and the underlying basement membrane and get rid of the underlying dermis to uh, exclude what's going on in the extracellular matrix of the dermis, here we simply then apply force and we look for deformation of the basement membrane. And what we find is that, in fact, the basement membrane is also stiff. In fact, it is one of the stiffest parts of the skin epithelium. So not only are the stem cells architects of their niche, but in fact, they're also architectures of the mechanical forces that are on them, both from below and from above. So what does that have to do with regards to conditions where there's altered tissue organization. And one of the classical cases of that is cancer, of course. And so we got increasingly interested in uh, what happens when oncogenic mutations in stem cells begin to override their normal behavior and their crosstalk with their environment. How do mechanical forces change during tumor progression? And how does that impact their behavior? Well. If you look at what goes on in a monolayered epithelium, uh, Axel Behrens and his group looked at, uh, at normal epithelium and tumorigenic epithelium from the pancreas and showed that cell proliferation and ectomyosin contractility dominate the architectures of the tumors from monolayered epithelia. What about tumors from multilayered epithelia? In a stratified epithelium like the epidermis, it turns out that stem cells of the epidermis can give rise upon oncogenesis to two different types of cancers. They happen to be the most commonly occurring cancers in humans by a long shot. They're basal cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. Basal cell carcinomas are driven by hedgehog pathway. Squamous cell carcinomas are driven by the RASMAP kinase pathway. And basal cell carcinomas are rarely aggressive, while squamous cell carcinomas are invasive and metastatic. 
The cancers exhibit distinct tumor architectures as well as distinct behaviors. Here, cell proliferation and actomyosin dynamics impact the formation of these two types of tumors, but it turns out that those parameters on their own do not explain these types of shape differences and types of properties that we see in these two types of cancers. So what accounts for that? It turns out there are mechanical forces then from other areas that are contributing to these uh, differences in tumor architectures. So here, what we did was to measure the stiffness of the tumor cells from both the squamous cell carcinoma, uh, developing squamous cell carcinoma and developing basal cell carcinoma by giving them the oncogenic uh, hits that they needed. And we looked at what's going on in the epithelium and in the basement membrane. What we found is that the dominating forces in tumor folding that are characteristic of squamous cell carcinoma are the stiff keratin pearls, those differentiated balls of keratins that are classical in a squamous cell carcinoma. Who would have thought that they were important at all? And they've been completely ignored in this context, but it turns out that that's the stiffest part of the squamous cell carcinoma. They're also typified by moderate basement membrane stiffening, a little bit less than what you see in the normal skin epithelium, but still appreciable. <clears throat> it turns out that they have very low basement synthesis assembly rates, which we measured by looking at fluorescent uh, laminin chain incorporation into the basement membrane. So that's extremely low. Then we looked at basal cell carcinoma tumor budding. That turns out to be promoted by a softening of the basement membrane. Look at how soft the basement membrane is at the, at the down point of the invaginations relative to that of the normal or the squamous cell carcinoma. And when you look at basement membrane assembly rates, it goes the opposite direction. <clears throat> basement membrane assembly is really fast in basal cell carcinomas. So at that point, we really wanted to team up with uh, Stas Schwarzman's group at Princeton and uh, between in a ping pong play really between uh, looking at computer simulations and looking at genetic uh, testing of the models, we went back and forth until we arrived at these conclusions. But when we did arrive at these conclusions, what we were left with is computer simulations that explained uh, the overall tumor architectures that we were seeing, characteristic of squamous cell carcinomas and characteristic of basal cell carcinomas. So the differences in basement membrane assembly rates were also reflected by extracellular matrix gene expression uh, in the basal cells of the BCC, where uh, the expression rates of the basement membrane con constituents is very high. We also see that uh, in very high at the transcriptional level. Uh, in contrast to uh, HRAS, which is relatively low in uh, wild-type skin and in squamous cell carcinoma. And the basement membrane is the major physical barrier between the tissue compartments, between the epidermis and the underlying dermis. Um, it's composed of uh, type 4 collagen and uh, largely self-assembling laminins, and type 4 collagen is the major tensile strength bearing network component, whereas laminin initiates de novo uh, assembly rates. And so, uh, again, taking advantage of our genetic system that we have for rapid knockdowns and testing, uh, we could really look at manipulating the basement membrane or manipulating using degrons, uh, manipulating those keratin pearls to really look at what are the consequences um, of these different types of pressure. So, when we start to look at different types of mechanical forces, uh, cancers have long been known to have differences in mechanical forces, and cancer cells are long known to take the uh, to aim for the path of least resistance. They will go wherever they can either change the forces or wherever the forces are the weakest. And so we've known that solid stress uh, occurs. <clears throat> 
in squamous cell carcinoma is just proliferation. You're proliferating the tumor cells and you create more and more cells within a, a confine of the uh, surrounding stroma. And um, if you invade the surrounding stroma, that's gonna re relieve, um, uh, relieve the, the, the solid stress. Um, but solid stress also compacts the vasculature and that leads to leaky blood vessels and lymphedema. Uh, blood vessels bringing nutrients in, lymphatic vessels bringing uh, other things out. And immune cell lymph node trafficking then, which are part of the things that use the lymph, uh, lymphatic capillaries for, um, can also be compromised as a consequence. We've known about extracellular matrix, the the bulk uh, collagen type one matrix that exists within the uh, stroma. Uh, we've known that cross-linking enzymes can play a role in that. And we know of course that actomyosin contraction can play a role in that. It can increase extracellular matrix stiffness. It can lead to activation of latent TGF beta signaling, uh, giving rise to cancer activated fibroblasts and increased ECM. So, what about then considering the tumor? Well, forces in the squamous cell carcinoma, as I mentioned, are high. Those keratin pearls that form can impart 60 kilopascals to, uh, to the tumor. And, and in contrast, jamming, which has been described in many different contexts, only contributes about one to 10 kilopascals. So, the uh, keratin pearls are definitely important in terms of uh, source of mechanical force. In addition, when you consider mechanical forces in basal cell carcinomas, they're much less than that of squamous cell carcinomas. There aren't any keratin pearls in basal cell carcinomas, and there's a high basement membrane assembly rate that keeps spewing out basement membrane, and so uh, that really impedes um, ba uh, basal cell carcinoma invasion and metastasis. The overall keratin pearls are exerting tension on the basement membrane, coming from above, pushing down on the basement membrane. And forces that favor basement membrane assembly, uh, basement membrane displacement, such as lowering the collagen type 4, for instance, will actually uh, cause uh, increased displacement, and that can even further uh, add uh, tension to the basement membrane and risk uh, run the risk of basement membrane rupturing. Mechanical forces on the basement membrane can also enhance squamous cell carcinoma invasiveness, but activation of membrane metalloproteinases, which we know to play a role in these types of tumors as well as in other tumors, uh, obviously also contributes further. So there are these multiple different ways in which changes in gene expression and changes in mechanical force, and the two can be linked, of course, through uh, a variety of different uh, transcriptional effectors, such as YAP and others, uh, can further contribute and integrate these, uh, these two parameters. So other considerations are lymphatic malfunction, and here a fluid pressure on stem cells can be enormous. Um, the presence of keratin pearls are sufficient to elicit the forces that are sufficient to constrict the vasculature, and, uh, and so that uh, can lead to lymphedema. So again, uh, mechanical forces can really impact the properties of the uh, cancers, and as I've shown you here, a matter of whether the cancer is going to be non-invasive uh, as a whole, or, whether, or, or at least non-metastatic um, as a whole versus, uh, versus uh, breaking down the basement membrane and, uh, and contributing to metastasis. So I want to get back to this issue on lymphatic vasculature because this is an increasing focus of my laboratory. And again, it's something that's only cropped up in the last year. And this deals with the work of Shuri Ger Cohen, who's a uh, biologist uh, postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And here, uh, one of the big breakthroughs in looking at vasculature within the skin was Shiri's adapting this, uh, the methodology of, of clearing methods to the skin. And this has really opened up the door for us because when we started to look, we thought at first it would be the, bat, the, uh, the blood vessels uh, 
that would be associated or bringing nutrients to the stem cell niche. And it turns out that it is lymphatics draining something that we are currently actively working on from the stem cell niche. And here you can see in red the lymphatic vessels and uh, relative to the stem cell niches of the hair follicles shown in green. And it's unmistakable that the lymphatics are creating this network that is connecting all the stem cell niches within the skin. And when you think about the coordination of stem cell niches, that is going to play a very important role in biology of the tissue. And uh, this just shows you in 3D uh, just how close these associations are. It also provided us for the first time with an understanding of why it is that in the hair follicle of the mouse, why is it that all of the stem cells coordinate their activity so that they're either in a resting stage where they're not regenerating the hair follicle and growing hair or in an activated state where they are? And now when you take a look at the lymphatic capillary network, we begin to understand why. And we've uh, used various different genetic methods to be able to disrupt these interactions and demonstrate that in so doing, we disrupt the synchrony of the stem cells across the tissue. So another interesting aspect about stem cell biology that we've learned from these studies is that it turns out that the stem cells are in control of the lymphatic network. In their resting stage, where the hair follicle stem cells are in a quiescent stage, they have very high levels of BMP and FGF18 signaling. They have very low levels of Wnt and, S and sonic hedgehog signaling. Their proliferation is down. Uh, it turns out that there is a protein called angiopoietin like 7 that Shiri showed works as a lymphatic connector. And wherever it's high, the lymphatic connector is connected to the stem cell niche. And then, of course, there are other transcription factors and other factors of stemness that are on and lineage differentiation determination genes are off. And that's the characteristics of these stem cells in a quiescent hair follicle stem cell niche. But then when you take a look at what happens at the start of stem cell activation and look at stem cells in their activated stage, now we find that there's a switch in the BMP signaling that goes down, the Wnt sonic hedgehog signaling goes high. Look at what's going on in the lymphatics. The lymphatic connectors now are down-regulated, and now there's angiopoietin-like 4 that is briefly elevated in the stem cells. That's a lymphatic dissociator, as Sherry showed. So there's a lymphangiogenic switch that occurs at the start of the new hair cycle of stem cell activation and hair growth. And that's associated then with suppression of the stemness genes and with activation of the lineage differentiation genes. So I'm gonna finish by bringing us back to uh, what's going on with the stem cells of squamous cell carcinoma and what happens when they acquire oncogenic mutations? How do they deviate from their course? And how do we get to the state of squamous cell carcinomas? And if we consider squamous cell carcinomas as a class, they affect not only skin cancer, but also head and neck cancers, vaginal cervical cancers, esophageal cancers, cancers of anogenital tract, and all of these other tissues, as well as the skin. And while you typically don't think of skin squamous cell carcinomas as being particularly bad for you. you, they can usually be excised if caught early. Patients on immunosuppressive drugs have a very high risk of metastatic skin squamous cell carcinomas. So even for skin, this is a devastating uh, type of human cancer. And we studied many years ago where the stem cells are in these cancers. We fractionated the stem cells from squamous cell carcinomas, performed serial transplantation studies, and they reside at the tumor stroma interface. Uh, so very much like normal stem cells do uh, in their normal epithelial tissues, so too do the cancer stem cells. But they really don't look anything like the, the normal stem cell counterparts. They've got many, many different changes in gene expression. And so what happens on the path to cancer that leads to this dramatic shift in gene expression, which as I talked about earlier, really impact uh, properties of the, of the tumor like, uh, like mechanical forces. And uh, Ye Jing who was 
a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory and is now running her lab at MD Cancer and MD Anderson Cancer Center, uh, looked at this um, from the perspective of the relationship between normal stem cells and cancer. And what she showed was that there's actually very similar patterns to what's going on at the chromatin level to that of, uh, of wound healing processes. And in fact, in the early stages of wounds, uh, what we see is that the stem cells, both of the epidermal stem cells and the hair follicle, they start to deviate and they turn on wound-specific uh, transcription factors that turn on wound-specific chromatin peaks. And when we looked at squamous cell carcinomas, what we found is that there are parallel peaks to wound response and now new peaks. And both the wound peaks and the new peaks have, uh, have ETS2 binding sites, with ETS2 being the predominant one in these new peaks. And so we know that RASMAP kinase is transiently upregulated in a wound, then downregulated again, whereas in cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, it's constitutively active. And that causes these peaks to open. And we can demonstrate that by virtue of first cutting out one of those peaks and showing that those peaks can act as squamous cell carcinoma inducing enhancers where they're not expressed in unwounded or wounded state, but only in the tumorigenic state. And we can also engineer a phospho mutation, activated mutation in ETS2. And when we induce that in the skin, what we find is dramatic transition of the uh, of the epithelium to a tumor-like state, and we see a dramatic shift of the chromatin structure to adopt that of squamous cell carcinoma. So we can drill down in both directions with ideally gaining further and further insights into how stem cells are basically controlling the process and how these stem cells go awry during malignancy. I want to leave some time for Q&A, but I just want to touch on two other factors. One is to recapitulate uh, some of the uh, findings that we made in, uh, in 2015 and 2019 uh, last year when we were looking at um, characteristics of these tumor-initiating stem cells. As I mentioned, we showed they were at the tumor stroma interface. And uh, what we realized is that there's tumor heterogeneity that uh, occurs in the microenvironment. Um, and it's due, uh, in part at least, to blood vessels. Wherever there's angiogenesis and a blood vessel comes up next to a tumor, it brings with it a milieu of various immune cells. And together, uh, they produce and secrete high levels of active TGF-beta. And that then impacts these stem cells in the close microenvironment, and that ultimately changes the behavior of these stem cells. And, uh, and another um, aspect of that is, is that it changes them in a way that affects not only their properties and their tumor generating properties, but it also affects their invasiveness. And so uh, the way in which we demonstrated that was to create a TGF beta sensor enhancer that uh, drove uh, fluorescent cherry and also drove um, a uh, CRE-ER, a lineage tracer, that we could activate whenever we wanted with tamoxifen. And so in, uh, in the tumor, wherever there is TGF-beta uh, from a blood vessel, which would be right here, which we can now show by our tissue clearing methods, now uh, we see a light up of the tumor stem cells and where there's no TGF beta, where there's no blood vessel, there's no single signaling. And when we monitored the behavior of these, of these cells by activating our lineage tracer, what we found is that these cells, when they receive a TGF beta signal, are slower cycling than their non TGF beta responsive uh, counterparts. But um, these stem cells also break down the basement membrane and invade. Relative to their uh, not relative to their non TGF beta signaling counterparts, so TGF beta really is acting as a tumor suppre suppressor and a tumor promoter, and in this context, a tumor promoter. So, the other interesting aspect about TGF beta that we've demonstrated over the last couple of years is that 
not only are these tumor initiating cells when they receive that signal uh, refractory to cisplatin, but they're also refractory to immunotherapy using effectively a cytotoxic T cell therapy that uh, Phoenix Miao, who's now just started his lab at University of Chicago, uh, has demonstrated. And again, we do this by activating our lineage tracing marker after we've treated the cancer and washed out the immunotherapy of the cisplatin drugs and then wait for tumor relapse. And so we now have a handle where we know that tumor relapse is basically occurring in these cells that are protected by their TGF beta signal and by the blood vessels. And now we would like to know what's responsible for the tumor relapse. And we've begun to dig apart the molecular mechanisms involved. And finally, another aspect that we've been interested in is what are those blood vessels bringing to the cancer? And uh, are they merely bringing a TGF-beta rich immune cell microenvironment or are they having an impact on tumor cell survival? And in uh, the last paper that we just published um, in during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, we demonstrated that tumor stem cells have an altered metabolic diet over their normal tissue counterparts. And that's the work of Sanji Baksh, uh, who just defended his PhD and is now finishing his MD uh, in my laboratory, not in my laboratory, but in the clinics uh, at Weill, Cornell. And uh, what Sanji showed was that uh, metabolism really converges uh, with chromatin dynamics in these cancers. And when the cancers get an oncogene, uh, it turns out that they um, start to avoid taking up serine from their nutrient sources. And they can make all they can make serine if they want to. It's a non-essential amino acid. There's a biosynthetic pathway. We demonstrated that the enzymes are all intact, but they don't do it. And so why do they try to avoid um, making serine? And it turns out that if they do, uh, then in that pathway of serine biosynthesis is the production of alpha ketoglutarate. And the alpha ketoglutarate levels go high in these cells if we force them to make their own serine and we take away serine from their diet or from their media. And that changes the chromatin dynamics and that changes the properties of the tumor. And what happens is that the tumor cells, uh, stem cells differentiate. We've done these experiments both in mice and also in human xenografts of squamous cell carcinomas. And in both cases, just shifting the diet can actually uh, greatly affect tumor burden. And, uh, and so that's really the last comment that I wanted to show you where tumor burden uh, in these same, same animals, uh, just by shifting the diet otherwise will, uh, will be reduced. So what I've told you today is a vignette of various different papers that we've published um, now that we've had the chance to actually write and um, put together papers um, since the COVID pandemic. And, um, and what are the prospects for therapy? I think targeting basement membrane properties are interesting from the one side. Um, RASMAP kinase is traditionally a hard druggable target, although there's some progress that has been made by uh, various different uh, companies. ETS2 is an interesting one because there's certainly a phosphorylation site that is a RAS MAP kinase driven site. So uh, there might be avenues. We've demonstrated that it is uh, one of the aspects of driving tumor genesis and driving the chromatin architecture. Uh, EIF2A is one I didn't have a chance to talk about today, um, but, uh, but this is a non-canonical translational initiator that we demonstrated uh, the tumor stem cells become addicted to. And, uh, and so uh, there we're actively pursuing uh, EIF2A inhibitors as a possible therapeutic avenue. Uh, TGF beta inhibitors um, have notoriously been problematic in the clinics, but we think that our data <laughs> is really suggesting why that might be because you cannot simply administer it from the get-go without first killing off those rapidly dividing non-TGF-beta sensing 
tumor initiating cells. Otherwise, the tumor will just grow like gangbusters and you'll expand the stem cell population. But if you first wipe them out with cisplatin and then go in and activate with a TGF beta inhibitor and then go back again with a chemotherapeutic or an immunotherapeutic agent, that kind of regimen might be promising for the future. And we're uh, talking to collaborators at uh, Sloan Kettering about these options. And finally, another one is <clears throat> the roots of the tumor initiating cells in terms of how do they, how are they refractory toward uh, immunotherapy. And there we uncovered that it's not just PDL1 in these cancers, but CD80 can also be dialed up by these cancer cells uh, in a way that um, uh, allows them to evade uh, immunotherapy by traditional ways. And then I always like the idea of shifting the animal's diet. So often when you're not, when you're looking for something, you can't find it. And it's often when you're not quite looking for it that some of the most interesting observations come up uh, that if you explore uh, can turn out to be very interesting. These are the people in my laboratory who are currently uh, doing new things that I hope to be able to talk to you about next time. Thanks very much again. That was great, Elaine. So uh, be before I actually go into the, to the real questions, Elaine, you'll be thrilled. The very first post on this was, and I quote verbatim, wow, it's an honor to be watching the Elaine Fuchs live. Oh, no. <laughs> So I, uh, I could get a kick out of that. Yeah, uh, whose dog was that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Adam Engler ha has posed a few questions. I'll, 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 I'll pitch them as he sent them along. Uh, the first one is earlier in your talk. Uh, AFM is a surface measurement. How are you measuring basal layers of the tissue? Yeah, I like the comment and the question. It's um, so two different ways. <clears throat> One is for the basement membrane. That was uh, that was really looking for deformation of the uh, applying force from above, but only from the epidermis that is associated with the basement membrane. So we can, using enzymes, we can basically um, peel apart and get rid of the underlying dermis and then just look at measuring deformation of the basement membrane. So that's what that measurement is in terms of getting uh, a sense of tumor stiffness. And we can manipulate that stiffness um, and demonstrated that if we downregulate collagen type four, then the deformation is greater if we increase uh, or stop basement membranes uh, uh, assembly rates, for instance, um, then we can also see an increase in the stiffness. So you can control uh, stiffness by these two different parameters. And that also bears itself out from the computer simulations that uh, the Schwarzman lab has done uh, for us. So the other aspect of that is for the tissue itself. Uh, there we had to do a um, flash freeze um, of the tissue. And so there's always that caveat that can be associated with the stiffness. Um, on the other hand, it is in agreement with not only what we know about the properties now from the other paper from looking at, uh, at uh, the role of filagrin, where we actually also in that paper use atomic force microscopy to look at when we manipulate what happens to the stiffness of the overlying epidermal cells. Um, but here we're, we're looking at a side probe. We're probing along the side um, of the tissue that we isolate from the mouse, which is really the only way we could come up with getting those numbers. So granted, there are these potential caveats, but, uh, but that was one of the major forces in our realizing that we really needed a collaborator to go back and forth with regards to genetic manipulations on our part and computer simulations on their part with our measurements in hand saying, if these are the measurements, does this explain it? Great. Uh, Adam's second question uh, deals with the lymphatics. And his question was, uh, the lymphatic vessel length appeared to vary, for, uh, vary within the images. And what, sense the, what sets the length? Is it regional stem cell proliferation differences? 
or differences in fluid mechanics, for example, flow rate, uh, shear stress, uh, things within the vessel? Yeah, great, great question. <clears throat> and um, one of the things, so we looked at that quite a bit because, um, because during the hair cycle, you go from the stem cell niche, which is really pretty much the base of the living part of the, the non-cycling part of the hair cycle, of the hair follicle. Um, and then you have to produce this downgrowth of hair follicle with every growth phase before you can start to produce the hair that, that, that grows out. And that process then we thought, well, what happens? Initially we thought, well, maybe mechanical forces are just breaking uh, the lymphatic uh, vessels. But what happens is actually there's a connecting, the, the lymphatic capillaries have to connect to the connecting vessels. And the connecting vessels are actually located down in the subcutaneous, near the subcutaneous layer. And so it's that extension that leads from the lymphatic capillaries down that is what's growing. And, um, and so that, uh, that is delineated in, in Sherry's paper. Um, anything else that you saw above, if that was shifting, that's probably due to the angle that we're taking in terms of looking at the lymphatic capillaries overall. But that's the major stem cell associated transition that we see. And, and maybe one more point I should make is that the angiopoietin like seven is always produced by the stem cells themselves. Um, and, and for most of the hair growth, the hair cycle, for most of that, uh, the stem cells are in a quiescent stage and they're attached to the lymphatic capillaries. There's um, just a narrow window that lasts maybe one, two days, right at the, um, just after the activation stage where the winds are high and the BMPs are low and the stem cells get activated. And right at that stage where they're, where you get stem cell activation for proliferation, um, at that stage, if you transcriptionally profile, that's when we see angiopoietin like seven goes down and angiopoietin like four comes up. And then you see it back again. Uh, as soon as the stem cell activation has happened, you see that, uh, uh, that restoration. And yet during that period, there's, there's many days thereafter where the stem, where the hair follicle is still growing downward. So we thought initially that it might be a mechanical property, but that's not what, what is the case. And, it's, and it can't be mechanical driving because otherwise we would still uh, we would still see the switch when the stem cells are, when the hair follicle is still growing downward. And instead the lymphatics connect back up with the, with the stem cell niche. Hopefully that addresses the question. The next question deals with uh, basement membrane, uh, your basement membrane mechano study. Okay. And uh, the questioner says that that would seem to imply that the force difference pushes basement membranes to open. Did you check whether protease mediated degradation is still required for basement membrane breaching? Yeah, I love the question. We would love to be able to look at this be, and one of the problems that we face, but I think with our genetic systems, it's over. we can overcome that problem. Um, there are many metalloproteinases that are expressed by these cells. And, um, and we know that they play a role from the work of Zena, the late Zena Werb and Mina Bissell and others. So, uh, so we would love to be able to look at mechanical properties in the absence and the ability to invade by manipulating, for instance, um, the keratin pearls versus manipulating the basement membrane and looking at whether that's enough to cause basement membrane rupture. Um, and we haven't been able to uh, do that experiment just by virtue of, uh, of overlapping redundancy. Um, the other issue is, uh, has been a challenge for us because when you think about it, <clears throat> on the one hand, if you allow too much basement membrane <clears throat> synthesis, then you, just <clears throat> then you just end up sort of spewing out basement membrane and you allow the tumor to grow downward. That's what happens in a basal cell carcinoma. So you see many of these lobes happening, but the basement membrane assembly is just containing it 
it contains the the tumor it never breaks through the basement membrane whereas if you and and so at first when we did the collagen for knockdown that um that weakens reduces the the stiffness on the basement membrane and what we found is that actually promotes invasiveness and we think it's because of this deformation but on the other hand so you might say well then than just making the basement membrane stiffer, uh, that ought to contain the tumor. But in fact, that then builds up pressure. So if you have proliferation going on inside the tumor, you can imagine a situation where now you've built up pressure and remember that the tumor cells <clears throat> are always gonna choose the path of least resistance. And eventually that probably is bursting through the basement membrane because the force is coming from above from both the jamming and the keratin pearls is just going to be too great no matter how uh, how stiff you make the tumor so uh, so we want to address these kinds of questions genetically because it's really suggesting that there is a window of stiffness um, and reducing the basement membrane that is really contributing to these mechanical forces that are leading to the process and then to dissect out is it is Meta are metalloproteinases even involved or are they the major players? They both could probably are involved, but who's the major player in the process? Great. The next question deals with uh, timing of the hair follicle growth cycle. What is the timing? What influences it? And is it in any way linked to circadian cycles? Oh, I love the question too. Um, so that's not our work about circadian rhythms, but um, the work of Salvador, uh, Salvador, Salvador Benita. Um, and he at, in the, uh, in the um, IRB in Barcelona, and he's looked extensively at this and yeah, it makes a difference. And so whenever we're doing any experiments, all of our experiments are done at the same for, for a particular question, all the experiments have to be done at the same time of day because otherwise we will, and, and for mice, they're alive, they're, they're alive and running at night and then they're sleeping in the day. And so you really have to control um, all of these different properties um, to make sure that you avoid ending up with caveats due to the fact that circadian rhythms do actually impact the hair cycle. Um, with regards to the the overwhelming the lion's share role of this process though um that the the first hair cycle um in mice happens uh the first resting period where they're really they're not proliferating they're just sitting there um that happens within a matter of one or two days the next hair cycle is extended to uh, to several weeks and the next cycle gets longer and longer as we, as we age or as the mice age. So um, it explains why our hair slow down with aging, but, uh, but it, um, there's that variability there. And we looked at it from a signaling standpoint and showed that um, BMP signaling is higher um, in, uh, in the next hair cycle and the next hair cycle. Uh, and um, it's because the stem cell niches build up. Um, you end up with sort of one stem cell niche for the first hair cycle, then you build some more for the next hair cycle and more for the next hair cycle. And then they all, then eventually they all sort of fuse into one master stem cell niche. And so you always have more niches with each hair cycle. So you're always going to have this higher level of BMP. We haven't looked at lymphatics yet in those cases, and I think that will be interesting for us to do. But the other big question is, we know that lymphatic connections are associated with, uh, with quiescence. And what we've shown is if we elevate the levels of angiopoietin-like 7 genetically, we can increase the resting time. And so the question is, and if we shorten it or we elevate the levels of angiopoietin like four, we can reduce the resting time. So, uh, so the question is, what, are, what is it about those lymphatics connected to the stem cell niche that maintains the quiescence? They could be draining something. Maybe they're draining key nutrients. Maybe they're draining key immune cells uh, that are important in stem cell activation. 
Um, maybe they are draining um, uh, metabolites. Maybe they're draining, maybe they're bringing, maybe the lymphatics themselves are bringing different growth factors or bringing different growth factor inhibitors, sorry. Um, or maybe they're draining growth factor, other growth factor inhibitors. So there's lots of possibilities and, um, and we're actively tackling that problem, but as you might imagine, and it could be the pressure itself, as you pointed out, that is controlling that. And, um, and in fact, we have some evidence for that. We showed that if we can increase the pressure just by injecting fluid into the skin, we can trigger precociously the hair cycle. So it could just be pressure um, that, has to, that has to be maintained at a certain level and then, um, and then builds up after you um, activate this, after you detach, and now fluid starts to build up, and then you and then you basically activate, and then it goes back to normal. But lots of possibilities, and um, and we're systematically checking off what we think uh, is important. But it's probably going to take us a while. Maybe next time that I give a talk here. Uh, Jeff Wall poses two questions. First, he. He, he says you have, gave a great talk. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Yeah. And then he, his first question is about uh, filigrin, and he was wondering whether it's reg whether its regulation is affected by his kinases or phosphatases. Mm. And then the second question, uh, he queried whether uh, a normal microenvironment can prevent the growth of epidermal cells that could be harboring many oncogenic mutations. Yeah. Great questions, both of them. First of all, phosphorylation probably plays a role. Filagrin does get phosphorylated. It also gets processed. Um, and it could be both filagrin processing and it could be filagrin phosphorylation that is impacting on uh, the overall acidity of the pro of the of, of filagrin and is causing and, and interferes or in one way or another or promotes in one way or the other the dynamics that we're seeing in these liquid phase transitions. We have not checked that yet, um, but it's obviously on the docket of something that we need to do. And um, it's a very good point that you're raising. Um, the second is is can we restore the normal microenvironment and actually get back. Um, get back normal tumor behavior. Uh, we are actively investigating that, but again, um, how to restore normal microenvironment is something that's going to be a challenge. Um, we could, of course, just do the uh, start by doing the tumor initiating stem cells and putting them back into their normal stem cell niche. I don't think that's going to work. Um, just by virtue of the fact that we know that there's high levels of RAS signaling, and, and if we elevate the level of RAS in, this, in the normal stem cells, we see um, a promotion to tumor genesis. On the other hand, um, in cancer, all that matters is sort of a, a balance. You know, everything is going to be a balance, and we know that, um, that, the, that the cancer stem cells are deviating uh, by virtue of high level of RAS. And so I think by uh, various different avenues to diminish the levels of, of RAS map kinase signaling in the tumor, various levels to diminish the, um, the TGF beta signaling at the right time. And then um, uh, we've demonstrated, for instance, if we knock out CD80 in the tumor initiating stem cells, then tumor growth just plummets. So, um, so there are various different ways to manipulate. Um, what we haven't tried is taking any of those manipulations that reduce tumor growth and seeing whether if we put them into a normal environment, um, will they work? And I think that uh, certainly they might work in many of these cases like CD80, for instance, which isn't, which isn't even expressed by the normal stem cells. So knocking it down should be fine. It, for homeostasis, the problem is going to be in a wound response. And we're testing things like that to see, can we tease apart in the ideal world uh, factors that are not involved in wound repair, but are involved in tumor genesis. And that's, that's the kind of thing that we're, that we're focusing on now in the lab. But to date, we don't have a, 
we don't have some clear, exciting answers that would satisfy George, Jeff Wall. Now, you may have alluded that he qualified the question, he wanted to, but you may have already sort of addressed this. How does the normal microenvironment prevent the growth of cells oh. that harboring tumor initiating mutations? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question too. We're looking, we're we're looking at that from the perspective of cellular competition. Um, we um, identified multiple mechanisms of cellular competition in normal tissue, um, and we're looking at how those competition mechanisms are being affected by uh, by RAS. And when is the point of no return? Um, is is one oncogene um, is one oncogenic mutation enough to, uh, to maintain normalcy? And if so, how? And then what happens when you start to build up oncogenic mutations? I mean, it's a great question and, uh, and um, one that really hasn't been addressed in the field. So uh, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. And we're, we're taking that one approach, but I think it's a, a great question. Okay, I think we'll probably make this our last question. And uh, the questioner wanted to know, uh, what is the status of using stem cells for burn victims? Ah, great question. Um, so fast forward through all of these years, um, two different things. Um, for burn victims itself themselves, it turns out that it is more effective to take um, pieces to take a piece of skin and just fragment it into thousands of little pieces and actually seed little implants of little pieces of skin on the surface. Um, the advantage there is that it contain, that contains the stem cells and their niches. Mm -hmm. And the other advantage is, is that it also contains the hair follicle stem cells and the sweat gland stem cells. And one of the overwhelming problems that people have fa been facing in burn therapy, and they're still not there yet, is that um, from the cultured epidermal stem cells, we've known for years that patients that get those grafts do not sweat, nor do they make hair. Mm -hmm. uh, hair Making hair, the, they can do without, uh, but sweating, they can't. That's a real problem. And so, um, so we've identified the sweat gland stem cells in, um, in mice, in, in all animals except human and higher primates, they only have sweat glands on their paws, so that limits how quickly you can do the experiments. Um, but, uh, but those stem cells are, I have been identified, the problem there is that in contrast to say mammary epithelial stem cells, which undergo this enormous tissue morphogenesis during pregnancy, uh, sweat gland stem cells just spew out more more sweat. If you go running, they just spew out, crank out more sweat. They don't get bigger. The stem cells really stay in, in largely in quiescence. So these are challenges for the field, um, but that really deals with sort of what are people doing now, which required a knowledge of stem cells, but, uh, but uh, turn out not to involve purified populations of stem cells, perhaps because we've known as we learn that stem cells really don't operate in a vacuum. Well, I, I want to thank you so much, Elaine, for uh, taking the time to fly into San Diego <laughs> yeah, right. and to, to give us a talk. And thank you all for your attention and see you next month. Happy holidays. Bye-bye. Thanks very much, Evan. Bye-bye.